future of nuclear energy is here. Nuclear energy is already helping to mitigate climate change and can help further reduce the usage of fossil fuels. Nuclear plants continue to innovate and meet specific needs like heating cities or producing hydrogen to help decarbonize industry and transport. All elements of the nuclear fuel cycle are being continuously improved, from fuel fabrication to waste management. And new technologies are further advancing the nuclear industry. Helping to build a new fleet of nuclear reactors to power our clean energy future. Well, hello everyone, uh, a very good morning to you and a warm welcome to Vienna. Um, to uh, excellencies, uh, to our distinguished guests, to Director General, uh, of course, those of you here in Vienna in the auditorium and those of you who are following proceedings virtually as well. Um, welcome to the International Atomic Energy Agency's Scientific Forum for 2023. My name's Hannah Vaughan-Jones and I'm delighted to be your moderator over the, the next two days. Our topic this year, as you just saw from that film, is nuclear innovations for net zero. Now, innovation, of course, is the bedrock of human development. Over the last two centuries or so, both humanity and technology have hand in hand brought unimaginable transformation to the world. But of course, the cost of that transformation has been pollution and climate change. This forum will be discussing how innovation in nuclear power will provide an alternative to fossil fuel plants and hopefully, hopefully do that at some speed as well. Now, following this opening session, um, the first technical session, which will take place after lunch, will focus on new reactor concepts that have already been implemented. Uh, we'll move on to a session that explores how innovative solutions in the entire nuclear fuel cycle um, will further the prospects of nuclear power globally. And in the third and the final technical session tomorrow morning, our speakers will showcase how nuclear technology can be used in new applications, contributing, of course, to a resilient uh, energy system. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping from me as well uh, to kick things off. The event is, of course, being live streamed. As I just mentioned, there is a virtual audience here. Um, if you yourself need to leave the room, then you can also watch all the proceedings online as well. You can use it via the app or indeed by the IAEA website. The app is the IAEA Conferences app. Uh, anyone who wants to ask a question, you can do so in the room. Please just wave at me um, and you will get my attention. And, uh, and if you are watching online as well, then you can use the chat function in order to pose a question. Uh, Wolfgang, who is uh, somewhere in the room as well, I can't see him at the moment, but he will be um, checking all of the questions over there, uh, waving. Wolfgang will be um, taking all the questions online and filtering them through to me as well and reading them out. Uh, the hashtag to use if you are following proceedings online as well is hashtag scientific forum. Um, and at the end of this session, just a reminder that we will be breaking for lunch. Uh, you can head to the cafeteria. I believe you can take an elevator down to the ground floor. We're on the fourth floor and on this floor and on the seventh floor, there are coffee corners as well where you can get snacks and refreshments as well. And now, without any further ado, please welcome our host for the scientific forum, the IAEA Director General, Rafael Mariano Grossi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anna. It's good to see you again. Thanks for joining us for uh, this year's uh, scientific uh, forum. And, and, and it's good to see this room uh, full of uh, interested uh, people following what we do. Uh, Presentado, uh, welcome. I just uh, had an opportunity to greet you at the entrance of the, um, of the VIC, uh, Secretary Granol. 
uh, honor to have you and ministers uh, from uh, the Republic of Korea, from uh, Sweden, uh, Monsieur Minister General François. Uh, C'est un plaisir de te voir, et Isabelle. C'est jamais bien. So, um, many things are being said these days about um, uh, energy, energy crisis, solutions uh, to the problems. And of course, uh, for many, many years, we have been advocating that, of course, uh, nuclear energy uh, had a place uh, at the table as part of the solutions we, we all need. Uh, but of course, from that enunciation to the concrete realization of that potential in real solutions being applied uh, all over the world, there is a distance. And um, this year's scientific forum, as you just described, talking about the program and the sessions that we are going to have, is about that, is about looking into the areas that are, are either a necessary, uh, important, or could be keys to some of the uh, problems and the challenges that may be uh, still existing uh, in terms of integrating to its fullest capacity and potential nuclear energy into the um, set of solutions that we, uh, that we need. Um, we all recognize the reality of global warming and climate change, and so much has been said about that. I will not regurgitate it, and you know it very well. Uh, the issue is that in, in spite of this, and in spite of the uh, rising um, of uh, the integration of uh, renewable energies in the energy mixes of many countries, still fossil fuels are growing. So there is quite of a paradox here in the sense that while we have one element that could be considered as virtues, uh, we still see that the dimension of the problem, which is the emissions that we are putting up in the atmosphere continues to be unabated or is not going in the, in the right direction. So um, what seems to be a solution does not seem to be getting us where we want to be yet. So uh, this is why we need to explore ways um, uh, by which we could, as we were saying, uh, integrate as it does uh, happen in, in, in some countries already now, and uh, France and Sweden, for example, are very good, concrete, today's examples of this happening, uh, where you can have a, a, an intelligent combination of uh, energy sources which would lead you faster to a decarbonized uh, matrix. But of course, of course, and this, I hope, will be part of the discussions that we are going to have with these um, um, policy makers and experts. Uh, there are certain things that uh, must still must happen. Innovation, and I think this is at the heart of some of the discussions that we are going to have, are part of that. Innovations um, include, under its... Uh, and there's this big umbrella uh, notion, um, a number of things uh, that have to do with the improvement in the performance and safety of existing uh, fleets. We should not forget that we have close to 450 um, operating nuclear reactors uh, all over the world whose life is being extended more and more. And, uh, they are approaching 100 years, 60, 70, 80. Uh, so what we, can, what we can see is that innovation is needed in terms of uh, prolonging the life of this life-saving, energy-efficient CO2 need abatters that are the good old nuclear reactors that we have. And I say this because, of course, there is a lot of, and, and rightly so, interest, um, excitement, 
um, about the possibility of uh, small and modular reactors, which is another element that I'm sure we are going to be listening uh, a lot about in the course of, uh, of the scientific uh, forum. Because certainly, certainly, uh, small modular reactors hold uh, this promise, uh, in particular in developing countries. And as you know, the IEA is a global family. And the IEA wants to make sure, true to the statute and the mandate that we have, that as um, President Eisenhower said 70 years ago, this is for all, mm, that we expand the uh, benefits of nuclear energy to as many countries as possible we, that are uh, willing uh, to, to have it. So, uh, yes, uh, um, we are going to be looking uh, uh, at that. At the moment, many possibilities, more possibilities than perhaps markets will accommodate. So we want to see and to discover together uh, what are the, which are the efficient pathways to uh, modularity that is feasible. Uh, to be integrated in a relatively short period of time because this is what we need in order to correct these very worrying trends in terms of global warming that we have uh, these days. And we are also going to be looking at aspects that have to do with the waste management, uh, which also requires uh, innovation, and we have excellent examples in, in Finland, in Sweden, in France, in Switzerland, in many countries that are already now tackling this issue with uh, great um, efficiency. And of course, and, and, and why not looking at aspects that uh, have to do uh, with the uh, financing of all this. Uh, it has been a very, very uh, steep and upward um, fight um, uh, in order to get, and we are not there yet, of course, uh, to get a, a level playing field when it comes to uh, financing nuclear uh, projects. Uh, until not so long ago, and still in some places, you do have written provisions that uh, forbid, yes, forbid, prevent certain international financing institutions from financing nuclear projects, because the word nuclear is there. So our job here is to elucidate, to educate, to show uh, as um, true to its uh, DNA in the case of the IEA with scientific facts and not slogans why this is the case. And so the scientific forum, hopefully, is this moment where um, uh, people converge to see where we are, how good uh, we uh, uh, are doing in, in this regard, and including uh, avenues, avenues uh, sorry, uh, for the future, like, like uh, fusion, where we see a lot of hope. And in a few days, we'll be in London, um, in a IEA uh, organized international conference on fusion, because fusion is no longer a scientific, uh, a purely scientific um, uh, challenge to be uh, discovered or resolved. A um, few days ago, I was in, in Cambridge, very impressed when I saw young entrepreneurs uh, putting together a company and telling me with the freshness and the determination of young um, innovators, they said, we want to put this in the market within the next decade. How about that? So the scientific forum of the IEA hopes to be that, hopes to be the place where we uh, analyze this um, um, opportunities, uh, these um, uh, avenues that we have uh, for, a, for a better future. Um, nuclear has been part of the solution, is part of the solution, and we believe can give uh, even more. This is our hope, and this is the place for an open discussion of what is ahead of us. So welcome, 
you all to the scientific forum. Thanks for coming, and I hope, and I'm sure, you will be enjoying and learning from what you hear from this podium uh, this morning and in the afternoon. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. CG, thank you very much. And as you mentioned there in your opening speech there, we do have with us some uh, very high-level member state representatives, which we're thrilled about. And so it's my great pleasure then to uh, welcome to the stage our first speaker, His Excellency Nana Akufuado, the President of Ghana. Mr. President. Madam, thank you very much. The Director General, U.S. Secretary for Energy, the Korean Minister of Science, the Ghanaian Ministers for Environment and Energy, and members of the Ghanaian delegation, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I have to begin by thanking the Director General for the invitation to participate and speak at this year's International Atomic Energy Agency Scientific Forum which is being held in this vibrant, historic city of Vienna. Nuclear innovations for net zero. The theme for this year's scientific forum is most appropriate as the world finds itself in a decisive phase, confronted by some of the greatest threats of the 21st century, such as climate change and rising demand for clean energy. Many countries around the world are experiencing the extremely devastating effects of climate change, with its attendant negative impacts on several economies. This is especially true for Africa, where we're witnessing fast and dynamic developments in many countries. On the continent, for instance, climate change has led to an increase in average weather temperatures, rapid expansion of deserts, drying up of dams and unpredictable rainfall patterns, all of which have a direct impact on agriculture and food security, and thereby contributing adversely to the economic development of several countries. It is clear that if we do not take rapid action to address climate change and its negative impacts now, the cost in the near future will be prohibitive and counterproductive to the socioeconomic gains we make today. We need to do this in a manner where economic development is not suppressed, but rather climate restoration supports our economic growth. I believe there are diverse solutions to combat climate change that will lead to a net zero carbon environment, as envisaged in several multilateral treaties and agreements, including the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, in particular goal number 13. Current knowledge on nuclear technology for electricity generation, when deployed for peaceful purposes, can be part of the portfolio of solutions that will help quicken the, the quick transition to net zero. Ghana is at the forefront of developing energy infrastructure in Africa, with some 86% of the population having access to electricity, with the, penetrate, the full penetration projected for 2024, i.e. next year, in advance of the 2020, 2030 SDG target. Our electrification architecture has been built on a diversified energy mix including gas, biofuel, and hydropower. However, a large portion of Ghana's energy mix still com comes from fossil fuels. We're committed to a clean, equitable energy transition that harnesses the full potential of all low-carbon sources, including nuclear power. To transform Ghana's energy systems, we've created an energy transition and investment plan that details what is needed to reach our goals, nuclear power will play a significant part in this transformation. Last year, I announced the inclusion of nuclear energy in Ghana's electricity generation mix. 
our energy transition plan, envisage this part of our electricity production to be from nuclear energy by 2070. This strong commitment and position are geared towards the provision of clean and affordable e electricity to drive our industrialization agenda. It is also meant to position Ghana as a net exporter in the ECOWAS region through the West African Power Pool. We intend to go beyond this project and put innovation at the front and center of our plans. Having operated a research reactor for 25 years that has trained nuclear engineers and scientists from Ghana and many other countries, we are at a vantage position to build on a long tradition in nuclear research. Ghana, together with her international partners, is critically analyzing the innovations in small modular reactors, the SMRs, and their potential for rapid deployment for clean and affordable energy. We're currently working with industry experts to study the feasibility of deploying this new technology in Ghana. At this event, I urge all of us to continue to work together to strengthen the international framework for knowledge sharing, technology transfer, and mentoring relating to the peaceful applications of nuclear technology, especially for the benefit of newcomer countries exploring nuclear power options. Furthermore, I hope the findings of this forum will be well communicated to all member states for them to understand better the enormous benefits of adopting nuclear technologies in transitioning to net zero. I do encourage the IEAE to find also more avenues to discuss nuclear technology financing solutions that support emerging economies in order to implement the technologies in these economies. In addition to financing, there should be a paradigm shift regarding how we conceptualize nuclear energy with a focus on the peaceful applications rather than its non-peaceful applications. Ultimately, this forum should be the platform in which identified challenges, corresponding international best practices and opportunities are shared con concerning nuclear energy as a plausible step in achieving the net zero transition the world needs. I thank you for your attention. Mr. President, Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, the US is without doubt a leader in nuclear innovation and on the forefront of uh, new technologies such as SMR, small modular reactors as well. So with that, it is my absolute delight then to welcome to the stage Her Excellency Ms. Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of Energy for the United States of America. Thank you, Hannah. And... Uh, Thank you uh, to DG Grossi, Mr. President. Appreciated your words to my uh, colleagues from France and from Korea, from Sweden, and to all of you. Um, thank you for, for being here at this scientific forum. First, let me just uh, reiterate the United States' position that the world's path to decarbonization depends on an embrace of nuclear energy. And I just want to share a bit about what we're doing in the United States. Um, we are first uh, committed to maintaining our existing fleet of reactors, which today provides our single largest source of clean energy in the United States. Um, and we're also committed to maintaining and growing our nuclear workforce, which we believe is work world class. And it uh, creates for us nearly half a million high-paying jobs in the United States. But um, obviously the job's not done at the existing reactors. Uh, reaching our 2050 net zero goals depends on at least tripling for us our nuclear energy capacity to 300 gigawatts or more. So that brings me to my second point, which is the United States is ready to embrace the dawn of this new nuclear age as well. 
Uh, since President Biden took office, we have invested billions of dollars in the future of nuclear energy, creating historic uh, tax incentives for investment in new facilities and production of nuclear energy. In fact, um, our, our traditional fleet is actually expanding. In, in late July, uh, our Vogel Unit 3 connected to the grid. It's a traditional AP 1000, but it's the first time that we have actually, in the United States, expanded large reactors uh, since 1996. That's the first reactor. The second one will connect early next year. And that's two, over two gigawatts of power, of nuclear power uh, that we will be bringing on just in this very short period of time. But of course, we're also working on building uh, the fuel, the supply chain for the fuel, both low enriched uh, uranium and high assay low enriched uranium. So we, we are working on creating the fuel supply chain in the United States uh, this year. So cross our fingers that we're able to get there, uh, at least uh, the investment in it. And we're not just uh, working to support the large light water reactors, but also the small modular reactors. As was said, micro reactors, uh, generation four technologies. Uh, you know, we, the Department of Energy just issued a report on pathways to commercial liftoff for advanced reactors, for those of you who may uh, be interested. Um, these advanced reactors, are key to reaching our energy goals because they can also obviously help to decarbonize energy intensive industries, uh, can work with hydrogen production, can work with desalination, um, district heating, uh, petroleum refining, f fertilizer uh, production, all of that. We are looking at SMRs uh, and advanced technologies for that. And many of these new reactors as well can uh, adjust their electricity output to match demand. So making them smart with our grid that we are increasingly adding technologies to be much more responsive to demand. So the benefits of new nuclear uh, are vast. They extend to our workforce as well. So many of the designs that we're developing can be sited on old or retiring coal plants. Uh, we call these Phoenix projects, where we can build on the expertise of fossil energy workers and bring them along in this clean energy transition. For example, in Wyoming, we've uh, awarded funding for an advanced uh, reactor demonstration at a retiring coal plant. In Texas, we're supporting a high temperature gas reactor at a long operating chemical plant. And, um, you know, uh, Director General talked about fusion. We're very bullish on fusion. President Biden has a decadal vision of a commercial fusion reactor in 10 years since our Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab achieved fusion ignition in December and has done so again in subsequent months. So it is not just a question of whether, it is a question of when. And so that's very exciting. So why all these updates from the home front? It's because I think they'll affect all of you too in so far as we want to learn from you. For us, we want to be able to help uh, our, in our efforts to get to globally net zero. I just met with um, yesterday with a whole slew of US nuclear energy industry leaders and they are very hungry to help us bring these advanced technologies to partners around the world. And so we've already forged uh, public-private partnerships with Romania and with Poland to expand their civil nuclear projects. And that includes uh, refurbishing and completing the Chernovoda uh, reactors and deploying an, uh, an SMR in Romania and helping us to st up stand up Poland's uh, civil nuclear program with US reactors. And so we're, help we're committed to helping more countries uh, do the same, help achieve their decarbonization goals with this uh, safe, secure, uh, and safeguarded deployment of nuclear technology. So here's my final message, is that the stakes are too high for members of this body to depend upon unreliable partners, those with maybe blatant disregard for international norms on nuclear security and nonproliferation, or those 
who use nuclear energy to exert political or economic pressures. While some new technologies solve existing non-proliferation and security challenges, others raise entirely new ones. And that's why the United States is making investments uh, in integrating security and safeguard technologies with nuclear power and fuel cycle advancements, embedding security and safeguards by design. Our um, NNSA, our National Nuclear Security Administration, is partnering with our domestic nuclear industry so that facilities that are proposed for export can readily meet international regulatory requirements. Uh, and we welcome continued conversation with, with governments and regulators and the worldwide nuclear industry about strengthening safeguards and security features for nuclear reactors and fuel cycles, doubling down on non-proliferation, doubling down on safety and security is critical, as you all know, to maintaining public confidence in nuclear technology. So this is a moment I actually like to call global coopetition, a combination of cooperation and competition. We, we've all run the numbers. We know that the clean energy future presents a massive opportunity for our economies. Um, and the pie is big enough, uh, big enough for us all to have a healthy slice. So let's combine our scientific expertise. Let's help more countries uh, look at nuclear energy as a sustainable long-term investment. And let's, uh, let's make real that great dream that President Eisenhower shared 70 years ago, harnessing the awesome power of the atom for a new era of peace and prosperity in this, what is potentially the greatest peace project of our time, a net zero world. Thank you. Secretary Granholm, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, the Republic of Korea is among the world's most prominent nuclear energy uh, countries and a major exporter of its technology. So please welcome his Excellency, uh, Minister of Science and Information and Communication Technology for the Rep Republic of Korea, uh, Mr. Lee Jong-ho, Minister. Yeah. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Director General Rafael Mariano Grossi and the distinguished delegate of our member states. It's my great pleasure to join this IAEA scientific forum uh, on behalf of the Korean government the Global Risks Report by the World Economic Forum underscored that among the 10 major risks we face in the coming decade, the top four are linked to the climate crisis. In fact, natural disasters caused by the climate crisis are posing threats to human lives and safety across the globe. As we are well aware, the only way to tackle the climate crisis is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This key to achieving this uh, lies in having a balanced energy mix that includes nuclear renewable energy as carbon-free sources. However, it takes time to commercialize renewable energy, leading many nations to consider nuclear power as a viable option to meet their future energy needs. That is why we are here today at this scientific forum. I look forward to hearing about various inno innovative nuclear technologies and the solutions for net zero from many countries. I hope this forum will serve as a catalyst for expanding the role of nuclear energy. Distinguished delegates, the Korean government is directing its national capabilities toward enhancing technological innovations to position nuclear energy, not just as a primary source of electricity, but also as a key player in achieving net zero. Since 2008, Korea has been actively implementing the future nuclear power system development plan with a specific focus on develop 
uh, developing Gen4 reactors. This dedicated focus on advanced reactor development has resulted in the development of small reactors. In 12 to, uh, 2012, Korea demonstrated its capabilities by obtaining standard design approval for SMART, Korea's first ever small mod modular reactor. And now we are developing an even more advanced and uh, innovative SMR based on SMART technology. The Korean government believes that the private sector should take the lead in the in technological innovations. This is especially true for the SMR sector, which aims to replace fossil fuels in such industries as a seawater desalination and the space exploration. Korea has become an advanced country in nuclear field through R&D and uh, industrialization centered on the public sector, including government-funded research institutes and the public corporations. The role of the uh, private sector is still limited to equipment manufacturing and the construction. Fortunately, the growing interest in SMLs to achieve net zero emissions has, has led to many Korean companies investing in SMR technology. To further support this momentum, the government is launching the Korea SMR initiative to assist private enterprises create a, an SMR technology innovation ecosystem. The essence of this initiative is, uh, is a government's commitment to transfer its accumulated SMR technology to private enterprises and to jointly develop some challenging technologies that are obstacles to demonstration and the commercialization with the private sector. Accordingly, Korea plans to transfer the core technologies of Gen 4 reactors, such as VHTL and SFL, which have reached the demonstration level to companies keen on commercialization. At the same time, we will promote public and private partnerships in areas that need additional research and development. As the first pilot project to kickstart these efforts, starting next year, the government will collaborate with the relevant companies to invest in developing high temperature gas reactors designed for industrial process heat with applications such as hydrogen production and other uses. This year, we have also kicked off the development of MSL aimed at reaching carbon emissions in marine propulsion and the floating nuclear power plants. Additionally, we have initiated the development of an innovative light water SMR known as ISMR, mainly focusing on replacing thermal power generation. Numerous domestic companies have participated in these projects from the beginning to secure core technology and are expected to take the lead in driving Korea's future SMR innovation. Distinguished delegates, global challenges such as climate change cannot be solved by one country alone. International cooperation and collective action are becoming increasingly vital, and that's precisely why we are gathered here today. We call upon all member states under the leadership of the IAEA to take a, a more active and proactive stance in promoting the role of nuclear energy. The government of the Republic of Korea strongly supports the IAEA's statement, net zero needs nuclear power, set to be uh, presented at COP28 this November, and uh, is committed to working closely with the IAEA to ensure that their efforts are successful. Distinguished delegates, on the sidelines of this general conference, 
Korea's exhibition booth features a 3D model of a net zero city simulation. This model demonstrates a city achieving energy self-sufficiency without carbon emissions by harmonizing innovative SMR currently under development in Korea with the renewables such as solar and wind power. I invite everyone here to visit and explore the exhibition firsthand. Thank you very much. Minister Lee, thank you very much indeed. Now, among the countries that have voiced a strong interest in developing nuclear power is Morocco. Uh, Her Excellency Ms. Leila Benali is going to join us next via video uh, message. Um, Minister Benali is the Minister of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development for the Kingdom of Morocco. And here's her video message. Distinguished panelists, Mr. Grossi, Director General of the IAEA, your Excellency Akufo Addo, President of Ghana, Your Excellency Mrs. Granholm, Secretary of Energy of the United States, Your Excellency Mr. John Ho, Minister of Science and ICT of Korea, and Your Excellency Mr. Westland, Vice Minister for Climate and the Environment of Sweden, and Your Excellency Mr. François Jacques, uh, General Administrator of the French Atomic Energy Commission of French. La ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's really an absolute honor to address you today as we convene for the opening of this scientific forum. And the theme that unites us today holds a very important significance in this era of energy transition. We want to look at nuclear innovations for net zero. And this question realizes at the very heart of our relentless pursuit of sustainable solutions to combat climate change. Distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the government of the Kingdom of Morocco attaches paramount importance to the energy transition that is the main driver of economic development and social progress. And since 2009, Morocco committed to a low-carbon energy strategy with four strategic orientations. We want to diversify our electricity mix. We want to develop our national energy resources, particularly renewables. We want energy efficiency and we want to integrate regional energy markets, including carbon markets. Furthermore, His Majesty King Mohammed VI, may God assist him, provided a strong impetus to increase the share of renewable energies in installed electricity capacity to at least 52% before 2030. We have four gigawatts of renewable sources contributing to the accumulation of local expertise and increasing interest of international companies in the national energy model. Today, renewable energy represents 40% of the total installed capacity, and we achieved a rural electrification rate of more than 99.86%. But these accomplishments still fall short of the ambitious goals that we set for ourselves and for decarbonizing our economy. Our new development model of 2021 emphasizes robust, independent and transparent regulation and the widespread availability of low-carbon energy at competitive prices. That's a real competitive shock for the economy and society. Through an open approach, the Kingdom of Morocco has strengthened its international cooperation standing. And through an open approach, the Kingdom of Morocco has progressively developed its nuclear and legislative and institutional frameworks. We established the CNESTEN, our National Center for Nuclear Energy Sciences and Techniques, in 1986, and we followed by the 2 megawatt Triga Mark II type research reactor in 2003. Our nuclear regulatory framework is built on one law, the law 142.12 in 2014, centered on nuclear and radiological safety and security. And we created AMSNOR, our independent agency for nuclear safety. It is entrusted with the oversight of compliance with nuclear and radiological safety and security standards across activities and facilities utilizing ionizing radiation sources. Ladies and gentlemen, it should not come as no surprise that provided that technological supply security and competitiveness conditions are fully met, Morocco would actively explore the nuclear option through various working groups established for this purpose. 
and these efforts primarily center on enhancing the country's nuclear infrastructure development following the methodology recommended by the IAEA. All the studies and evaluation of national capabilities condu conducted under the auspices of the IAEA have enabled Morocco to build a strong knowledge base, a significant international recognition, and a real establish, established credibility. Distinguished panelists and ladies and gentlemen, the fight against climate change and the delay in achieving our SDGs demand bold solutions, and nuclear innovations emerge as an essential component. Advances in this field, whether it's four-generation re reactors, nuclear fusion, small modular reactors like SMRs, hold significant promise. So by combining nuclear power with, with intermittent renewable energy sources smartly, we can ensure a reliable energy supply. That's why Morocco places a distinct focus on smart modular reactors due to their numerous advantages, including their flexibility for integration into medium-sized electricity grids. They hold significant promise for diverse applications, such as combined heat and power generation and seawater desalination. That's why Morocco actively supports the IAEA Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, which aims to facilitate the secure and responsible deployment of SMRs. Ladies and gentlemen, nuclear technologies can reach their full potential only when we have a pool of highly skilled professionals and substantial investments in education, training and research to equip our younger generations with the necessary expertise to spearhead this energy transition. By supporting human capabilities in Africa and beyond, we can ensure that no one is left behind in this crucial transition toward a greener, safer and more sustainable future for all. I am delighted to announce that Morocco, through CNES-10, has recently achieved recognition from the IAEA as an international center based on research reactors. This achievement is a first for Africa, positioning Knesten alongside seven other ICER centers worldwide, including Belgium, France, the Russian Federation, uh, the Republic of Korea, Romania, and two centers in the United States. And this success underscores Morocco's commitment to nuclear excellence and paves the way for future collaborations. And I hope that similar centers will emerge in Africa as this represents an exceptional opportunity for the entire continent. Morocco's national infrastructure that is now reinforced by this recognition is open for the benefit of the African continent with a focus on capacity building. This approach reflects our strong commitment to regional cooperation in alignment with the vision of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI. May God assist him. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, nuclear innovation proves to be a crucial element of our path towards a net zero emissions future. It is really essential for the continuation of human life on Earth. Thank you very much. And uh, our thanks, of course, to Morocco and to Minister Ben Ali for sending that, that video through to us. Now, um, Sweden has been um, operating nuclear power plants for, for many years now and has recently received significant praise for the development of an innovative concept for spent fuel disposal. So with that, our next speaker is uh, Sweden's Vice Minister for Climate and the Environment, His Excellency, Mr. Daniel Veslin. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues. I would like to thank uh, Director General Grossi and the IAEA for the invitation to provide remarks at this scientific forum and providing us all with the opportunity to meet here today to explore the potential for nuclear energy in the fight against climate change. Climate change is an unprecedented challenge to the world. We have to plant trees, restore wetlands, replace gases with high warming potential and reduce emissions in agriculture. But unless we fix the fossil emissions from the energy and transport sectors, there is no chance that, uh, of stabilizing the rising temperature. I claim that there are three sources of energy that might be deployed on a, on a scale large enough to replace the fossil fuels. These are solar PV, wind energy, and nuclear energy. Hydro, biomass, geothermal, tidal, and the others will give us valuable contributions. In some places, they may even dominate, at least in the electricity mix, but they're all limited for different reasons. 
On a global scale, it is solar, wind, and nuclear that will have to replace the fossil fuels. Of these, only nuclear is dispatchable. This gives nuclear energy a unique role in the fight against climate change. Colleagues, before I came here, I went to see Dr. Hans Blix, the former director of general of the IEA. We had a long discussion on the agency and on nuclear power in general. Then he said something that stayed with me. He said that humanity has been very fortunate. We uh, got access to nuclear energy at precisely the point in history when the emissions from fossil fuels became a problem. Uh, Dr. Blix is right. If nuclear energy would have been de developed just somewhat later, it would have been very hard for us to solve climate change. I'm convinced that weather-dependent energy from solar, wind, uh, and uh, other sources will play a very important role ahead. Probably solar and wind will provide us with the vast majority of the energy we need once the fossil fuels are gone. However, I seriously doubt that we will see energy systems without a large portion of dispatchable capacity, especially this is the case for electricity being so difficult to store. In Sweden, we have spent the past 40 years trying to expand different forms of renewable energy. It has been successful. Wind power has grown to provide a significant share of our electricity. Biomass has replaced oil and coal in district heating and industrial processes. What was forgotten, though, along the way was that the power system is very sensitive and that it has to work technically. It's not, not just about adding terawatt hours. You also have to obey Kirchhoff's laws. It is increasingly obvious to broad groups in my country and elsewhere that energy systems have to be designed starting from people's needs. After all, assuring access to affordable energy when and where people need it is the point of having an energy system in the first place. I claim that this requires dispatchable energy. The requirement that our energy needs have to be met without carbon emission limits the number of options. When we look at what we are left with and add that we have to roll out this dispatchable energy on a global scale, nuclear energy is the only option available. We are lucky that it was invented in time. Colleagues, the International Energy Agency has highlighted scenarios for reaching net zero emissions globally around 2050. Similarly, the IPCC one and a half degree report presented a range of scenarios that would keep temperature increase within one and a half degrees. These scenarios typically foresee a doubling or even a tripling of nuclear energy to 2050. Can that be achieved? Can the world build 20 or even 40 gigawatts of nuclear energy per year? I would claim it is possible. We've done it before. Around 1980, we had more than 180 reactors under construction globally. We did add more than 30 gigawatts in one single year. This was achieved by a much less developed world than the one we live in today. In Sweden, we de deployed 12 large reactors in between 1972 and 1985. For a decade, we had one reactor under construction per one million uh, inhabitants. Translating this to a global scale really gives you a perspective. Colleagues, nuclear energy has significant potential in reaching global net zero greenhouse gas emissions and to increase energy security by reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. We need to keep developing reactors and their components. We also need for a forward-looking perspective on the fuel cycle. Even though long-term spent fuel management has now been solved, we need to keep working on closing the fuel cycle. With many war reactors, we will need to make better use of the spent fuel than to put it in geological storage. We're not in a hurry, but recycling, advanced fuel manufacturing and fast reactors have to be available when they will be needed. Most importantly, the knowledge we have on these technologies may not be lost. The work needs to continue. Colleagues, Electricity and heat in Sweden is almost free of fossil fuels. This is thanks to electricity production from mainly hydropower, nuclear power and wind power. 
as well as heat from biofuel-based district heating and heat pumps. Fossil fuels remain mainly in the transport and industrial sectors, which each account for around a third of the Swedish uh, greenhouse emissions. Our emissions are around five tons per capita per year. From having had an almost constant need for electricity for about 30 years, we now foresee that the electrification of industry and transport will at least double our electricity consumption in the coming 20 years. This transition is driven by the EU's climate policy and Sweden's long-term goal to be climate neutral in 2045. Another driver has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This has raised the awareness of the importance of energy security and the security of supply. Dear colleagues, I claim uh, that climate change is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced. It concerns all of us, and we all need to wor work together to fix it. Fortunately, though, we are in possession of the tools that we will need to solve this. Thank you so much. Minister, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, with France, we have the country with the world's highest share of uh, nuclear power and its uh, electricity production. So please do join me in welcoming His Excellency, the General Administrator of the French Atomic Energy Commission, Monsieur François Jacques. Thank you, Director uh, General Gossi, Cher Raphael, uh, distinguished guests, Your Excellencies. That's uh, an, a pleasure to be here today to take part to this uh, scientific forum. As usual, scientific forum of AEA is a cornerstone of uh, uh, the General Conference. And uh, this year, as ever, I think the theme is well-chosen and timely. We need innovation, obviously. I do not have to remind you of the long history of France with uh, nuclear energy. Obviously, that's an 80-year old history, but this was, uh, I would say, further reinvigorated by President Macron, who decided to launch new uh, power plants, six new EPR, but also a, a program dedicated to nuclear innovation with small and advanced modular reactors. So why do we need innovation? I think we are faced with a conundrum. We need energy, which is at the same time cheap, affordable and sustainable. And that's not so easy to solve this conundrum. So that's just why we need innovation. And I must say also that innovation will be probably a tool to attract the young generation to nuclear energy, which is also hugely needed because we have to replace uh, the current generation and to, to attract the new ones. Uh, many things were said about uh, nuclear energy during the previous intervention, so I will limit myself to a few remarks. The first one is probably that uh, when you speak of nuclear energy, that's not only a matter of electricity. That's also a matter, of, for instance, of, of heat, uh, of steam, and so on. That's another field of innovation, that is to think the new uses we may imagine for uh, nuclear energy, combining nuclear energy with other forms of usage, be it in energy, be it we, in other industrial forms. So I think that is uh, certainly a field of innovation. My second point would be that we need an integrated research and innovation policy. We shouldn't oppose the various forms of energy. They should work together. That is nuclear energy, renewable energy. If we want to combine them in new forms of grid, clearly it also requires innovation. So an integrated approach is needed, and I think this integrated approach should uh, tackle the various forms of need we have, be it the fuels, be it the reactors, be it the cycle, but also the various time frame we need to work for today, and today that is the extension of the life duration of the current fleet, but we have also have to work for, let's say, the end of the century with a close-end uh, cycle for the fuels and, and certainly advanced uh, reactors with uh, Generation 4 or even beyond with molten salt reactor or, or whatever. So uh, innovation should be comprehensive. My uh, fourth point would be that we certainly also have to take stock of all the progress we made in the scientific field. Many things were done in, let's say, 60s and 70s and dropped in terms of uh, nuclear reactors and so on. And now 
that we have uh, artificial intelligence, that we have high-performance computing, that we have all the tools to explore the matters. I think we have new tools to revisit all the concepts, and I think innovation will also, goes, will also go hand in hand with revisiting the concept and mobilizing in a cross uh, 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 sectorial approach all the resources we have in, in the field of science and technology, and I think that that will be key. And my, let's say my final remark will be that we will also have to innovate in the field of cooperation and partnership. We have to invent new forms of cooperation. We have to, then, to invent new forms of research and technology organization. I'm belonging to CEA. CEA is a research and technology organization making science, technology, markets, industry, companies, uh, cooperate together in one single place. And I think we have to invent such kind of place if we want to produce the innovation in the nuclear for the future. We have to take stock of the heritage of the legacy, but we have also to promote new approaches. Finally, I want really to thank uh, uh, Director General Grossi for this opportunity and the forum because uh, putting on the agenda this theme of uh, innovation and nuclear, I think he shows that nuclear is not only a, a solution for energy now, but it's also opening vast avenues for progress for the future, and, and hence, I think the agency lives up to the expectation of today, but also to the heritage of the Atoms for Peace it was created for. So, thank you very much. So, Jacques, thank you very much. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from, from ministers and, and high-level policy makers now. And uh, now it's time for our keynote speaker, Isabelle Be uh, Bemike. Um, Isabelle is known for her viral TikTok videos, um, which I think she's probably going to show you a little bit of in her presentation. Um, born in Brazil, and in the wake of the 2019 Amazon uh, rainforest wildfires and the Australian bushfire season as well, Isabelle began using your social media platforms to advocate for nuclear power as a solution to uh, climate change. So today, I believe you're going to tell us how, through your, your persona of isodope, um, uh, you tap into social media trends so very effectively to bring nuclear energy to a whole new audience. So delighted to have you here, Isabelle. Thank you so much, Hannah. Can you hear me? <laughs> your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's truly an honor to be here hearing from all these amazing leaders in, in the world championing nuclear power. It's very inspiring to me. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about my favorite source of clean energy, but I'm also going to talk to you about courage. And my hope is that when you live today, you have a lot more of that, both clean energy but specifically courage. I'm Isabelle Vemicki, and I'm best known as my online persona, Isodope. Now, as far as I'm concerned, Isodope is the world's first nuclear energy influencer. And this is what being a nuclear energy influencer looks like. Hey guys, so a lot of you have been asking about my diet. I start my day by drinking pure black coffee. Then I usually work out for about an hour or so. After working out, I eat something a little bit unusual, gummy bears, roughly the size of uranium pellets. Uranium pellets are the fuel used in nuclear power plants. And just like gummy bears, they're super dense, which just means they're small but have a lot of energy inside. One uranium pellet, roughly the size of a gummy bear, okay, you get it by now, has as much energy as 149 gallons of oil, 2,000 pounds of coal, or 12,000 Big Macs. With one of these tiny little things, we can power a house for about two and a half months. That's unless you're being a total idiot, leaving all your lights on while binge watching Netflix, blow drying your hair, and using a blender. This means that we can create an insane amount of energy in smaller spaces, which requires less land, which is great news for the environment. It also means that the waste it creates is tiny. If I were to get all of my life's energy from nuclear, my waste would fit inside of a soda can. Ew, 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 ew. ew. Don't ever drink soda. Sugar is like really bad for you. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad this is a forum about innovation because this is innovation in nuclear communication, I guess. And, and this is how I got started. So back in 2019, I innocently opened Twitter to see the news and I saw these horrifying photos of wildfires in California. And later in that year, more wildfires, this time in Australia and in the Amazon in my home country of Brazil. So 
those photos were a clear sign to me that climate change is here, you know. There, it's not a problem for the future anymore. It's here now. Now, most people in this situation just throw their hands up in the air and they say, you know, there's nothing I can do. But I maybe naively was convinced that I could play a small part in helping address the climate crisis. And as I looked into potential solutions, it very quickly became clear that there is no future, at least not one worth having, without nuclear energy. You know, it's clear by now, and we, we've heard of all these amazing speakers, that we're not going to be able to decarbonize and provide clean, abundant energy for all, not just the few privileged folks in developed countries, without nuclear energy. But there was a small problem. People seemed to hate it. And to be honest, before I learned about it, I was also afraid of nuclear power. That's what everybody said, right? Nuclear power is bad. But why was everyone so anti-nuclear? I mean, after all, nuclear fission is, you know, one of only two technologies that has track record of decarbonizing grids at scale. And it's one of the safest ways to make electricity. So again, why was everyone so anti-nuclear? Well, oddly enough, in part because of pop culture. The China Syndrome, which was a Hollywood movie about a nuclear reactor meltdown, premiered 12 days before the Three Mile Island accident in the United States. So imagine how that affected public perception. We had the No Nukes concerts in the late 70s where 200,000 people gathered to listen to some of the most iconic musicians at the time decry both nuclear weapons and nuclear energy as if they were the same thing. And of course, we had The Simpsons. <laughs> so I thought to myself, hmm, if pop culture is in part to blame for this warped view of the technology, what if I use pop culture to set the record straight and just relay the facts about this technology? So I decided to create an entirely different way to communicate that nuclear fission is one of the safest, the most reliable, and objectively the coolest way to make electricity. And that's when Isotope was born. That video I showed you earlier was seen by almost a million people across social media platforms all around the world. And my content went so viral that I was invited to give a TED talk. Here's a clip from it. What if this technology offers our best hope for the future? A future where wars aren't funded by our addiction to fossil fuels. A future where energy is clean. A future where electricity finally makes its way to the 700 million people on Earth who still don't have access to it. The idea that nuclear power is bad is costing us that future, and it's time to let go of it. Altogether, my videos have been seen millions of times, and you know, has, it has led to, among other things, being interviewed by Oliver Stone for his documentary on nuclear power, and signing a book deal as well. And all it took was some curiosity, a fresh approach to social media, and a lot of courage. So let's talk about social media for a second. I imagine if I ask everyone here to show your hands, you know, raise your hands if you use social media every day, most of you, if not all of you, would raise, even if you have a fake account that you access. Um, and you know, I know that so social media can sound superficial, but the reality is that's how young people learn about the world. They, and they trust influencers' opinions on products, health tips, and ideas themselves. And while we've seen social media being used for bad, I believe we can leverage these tools and actually use it for good. My videos might seem a little unusual, but I promise they work. Just look at this graph. The green line represents the support, the percentage of people in America who support nuclear energy for electricity. Look at that sharp increase in 2020. Coincidentally, the year I started making videos. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's all because of me, but I am just saying. On, on a more serious note, I've witnessed countless interactions at this point of people on social media raising genuine concerns about nuclear power, and then after some back and forth with another user, they say they were misinformed and they're now open to it. And most gratifyingly, I've received several messages like this. This is a friend of mine telling me that his sister is now working at a nuclear energy company because of my efforts. Very gratifying. And I think we all here know that we need nuclear energy, and people need to understand the truth about it. 
One of the most bizarre things I've witnessed in my journey as a nuclear advocate has been how many leaders secretly behind closed doors will say, you know, I support, I support it, but I would never say publicly because I'm afraid of the backlash. And I imagine many of you here in this room have heard that before, or yourselves have experienced it. So if that's the case, I'm here to tell you this is not the 1970s anymore. Young people are very much open to it. And they're waiting to hear from people like yourselves that it's okay to support this technology. So getting the population informed on all the benefits grants license to our leaders to, to pursue realistic decarbonization paths, paths that very boldly include nuclear power at the heart of it. But what can you do? Well, the first step is recognizing and acknowledging that young people need to be at the center of this conversation and decision making. After all, we and our kids have a bigger stake in the future. But most young people don't have the time or the knowledge necessary to, lead, to read long, boring academic papers. So it's also important to identify the young voices who are doing the hard work of translating all of that important information into a language that's accessible, effective, and inclusive. People like Kaylee Cunningham, who's a nuclear engineering student and makes TikToks about, about nuclear power. She has over 100,000 followers. Or like DJ LeClear, who is a radiation health physicist and also makes videos about how radiation impacts or doesn't the human body. His videos have been seen by millions of people at this point. So whenever you come across young people doing innovative communication work, don't dismiss them. Go the opposite direction. Treat them with respect. Help elevate their voices. And help make connections, both political and academic, so can, they can improve their work as well. So in 2021, I wanted to move my efforts from social media into the real world. So I created a grassroots effort to save Diablo Canyon, California's last nuclear power plant. This one power plant alone prevents 7.2 million metric tons of CO2 from entering the atmosphere every single year. And we knew that if it was shut down, it was going to be fully replaced by fossil fuels. When I told people I wanted to save the plant, Needless to say, I was met with a lot of skepticism. Most laughed me off, some said there was no way I could affect change, but I didn't listen to them and I kept going. And because I had a good social media follower, following, I was able to organize a rally to urge the governor of California to delay the closure of the plant. It was the largest pro-nuclear rally in the United States history. Lo and behold, what was considered impossible by many was achieved in part by a young woman with a bold idea. Diablo Canyon will now stay online for at least another seven years. I'm hoping 20, but guaranteed seven. But this is a clear example where if you give young people the right tools, we can get stuff done. I'm just gonna be honest here, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired, <laughs> I guess everybody is, but I'm tired of opening the news and seeing a new wildfire every single week. I'm tired of reading about our oceans reaching high record temperatures, our oceans. You know, I've noticed people, people used to start their day by looking at the weather forecast to know if they need a jacket to go outside, but now in many places of the world, we have to look at the air quality index to know if it's safe to breathe outside. In my own life, I notice I have air filters in every room of my house. But that's not normal, and we cannot allow this to be the new normal. And it's not like we don't know how to solve this issue. You know, we have all the technology. We already know nuclear is safe. We already know nuclear is clean. We already know it can decarbonize grids at scale. We already know it's going to create millions of jobs. So if everyone in this room knows these things, what we need from you now is to listen to the young voices who are waking up. It's to have the courage to not tiptoe around this issue, confront it head on, and declare boldly, the world needs more nuclear energy. I have just one question for you. Are you leaders or are you followers? Because to be a leader, is to lead people into a better future with courage. I need you to move beyond the conferences and the spreadsheets and the chit chat. 
There's no more time for that. We need to make things happen so we can have a livable planet. And the only way we can have a livable planet is if all of you here step up and lead the change into a nuclear energy future. Thank you. Wow, goodness me. I can't think of a more eloquent or elaborate or empowering kind of way of uh, finishing off this uh, opening session for the Scientific Forum this year. Huge thank you to uh, Isabelli, who is tired for all the reasons you just said, but also hugely jet-lagged, which I'm sure is probably shared by many of the other people in the room as well. So thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, may I ask that everyone please just stays in their seats while we uh, say goodbye to some of our uh, distinguished guests. Um, but that does conclude uh, the opening session. Thank you so much to Director General um, and also to our esteemed speakers uh, for this opening session. Um, and I think uh, probably on their way out now. Please join me in thanking... His Excellency, the President of Ghana, and some of our esteemed guests. Thank you.